Welcome back to a brand new episode of LLM News where we cover some of the most interesting and exciting developments around AI and the world of large language models. Before getting started, please consider leaving a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. That really helps the channel and allow us to keep doing these videos for you. First up, we have this major announcement from Anthropic, prompt caching with cloud. So they're announcing their prompt caching feature. As we have seen, Gemini also has support for caching and we did a video on that. So they are enabling this in their API calls and it's available right away in the Anthropic API. And this reduces cost by up to 90% and latency by up to 85% for longer prompts. And prompt caching is available today in public beta for Cloud Tree Profile Sonnet and Cloud Tree Haiku. So there are a couple of ways how you can use prompt caching. And we are going to discuss some of these actually in the future where I will be doing a longer video on how to use this particular prompt caching feature with Anthropic. So I will do a separate tutorial around that. So stay tuned for that. So the use cases that they're recommending here for using prompt caching are conversation agents. These are agents that potentially would have like higher latency. And prompt caching makes a lot of sense for yeah, for conversation agents because of that latency issue. A coding assistance, a larger document processing, detailed instruction sets, agentic search and tool use. I think this one is interesting because when you're building these agents, you have this tool usage mechanism and you have to include that functions or defining tools and so on. And so because you do that very repetitively, it'd be good to cache that and then reuse the tool. The only thing I would say, again, is the time limit that you have. So that's something that you have to be able to work around. You can talk to book papers, documentation, podcasts. I think this is probably the most common use of prompt caching today. And the reason is because you can just upload documents and prompt with them. And the idea of prompt caching is that you cache that document, you cache that book or paper or whatever, and then you just query it. You only get charged once for caching, and then you get charged for some second request, only what's in the user input. So they have the pricing here. So you can see here, it's very clear for the different models. So for instance, they will charge you $3 per million token. And for prompt caching, you get charged $3.75 per million token. So that's the cash, right? So when you write to cash and you do that once, and then in the subsequent call, you get charged 30 cents per million token cash read. So it becomes a lot cheaper, right? So you're not paying the $3 again. So it says here that writing to the cash costs 25% more than our base input. That's what's shown here. And then while using cash content is significantly cheaper costing only 10% of the base input token price. So you get the benefit afterwards. And again, because it needs to write to cash, it will probably be a little bit slower in that first request and subsequent requests will be a lot faster. So they have a good documentation here. Do check that out with a lot of examples. Again, we're going to do a tutorial on this. So stay tuned for that, where we go through our own examples on how to use this prompt catching feature. Bye. Next up, we have this announcement from XAI. XAI releases Grok2. And this is their next iteration of Grok. So you can find all the details here. They are releasing Grok 2 and Grok 2 Mini. So these are available to use already for Grok users on the X platform. So we actually took this for a spin this past week. And we have a video on that where we go through a variety of test cases, testing the model for code, reasoning, and instruction following capabilities. And let me tell you, it's a pretty good model. And actually they rank pretty good on the LMCS leaderboard. It ranks pretty good on the LMCS leaderboard. And after testing it, I think it's a very good model. And what they're saying is that it can outperform both Cloud Superfast Sonnet and GPT-4 Turbo on a variety of tasks. There has been a lot of updates on the LMCS leaderboard. This is one of the community leaderboards that is now followed for monitoring the most capable models or most capable LLMs. I think it's a good timing to look at what the updates have been on the LMCS leaderboard. In particular, we're going to talk about Chatbar Arena. And you can see that this particular source column R, which is Grok2 early version, is now public. And you can see that it got 12,000 community votes. You can see it ranks here third place together with GPT-4.0. So it's this checkpoint in May. It's right below Gemini 1.5 Pro Experimental, which is another great model, and ChatGPT 4.0 latest, which is a very recent checkpoint as of last week. And so that's the result. That's the update on the chatbot arena. There Next up, we have this Genie model, and this is a software engineering AI system that achieves state-of-the-art on SWE Bench, which is a very difficult benchmark, and they achieve 30 0.08%, and that's a 57% improvement compared to the second best model here on this particular benchmark. So you can see all the different models here. And you may wonder, how did they achieve this? Well, I think the summary I gave here buys the main takeaways. So 
essentially they focus a lot on reasoning data sets. You can read the blog more in details from their announcement. In essence, they have put a lot of effort in reasoning data sets. And I think that makes a lot of sense. The reasoning data sets do enhance these models as we have seen from past research and projects. In addition, they also enable like agentic systems with native capabilities to retrieve, plan, write, and execute. So their models can do all of this. And they also include self-improvement to continue to improve the model to fix mistakes when they arise. So it looks like this recipe here is what these modern agentic systems are supporting in order for them to be really good at the specific tasks that they are addressing. You will see a combination of these for like these future modern agentic systems. So if you're following this space, I think it'd be good to take a look at some of these efforts, especially in the research side of things. What are the new ideas for recent data sets? How are people thinking about self-improvement? How that's improving as well? And it reminded me of this particular post that Andrej Karpati wrote a while back. And he mentions that the ideal training data for an LLM is not what you wrote. It's a full sequence of your internal thoughts and all the individual edits while you wrote it, but you can make do with what there is. And so what's the next step? The next step is to sort of go deeper with the data sets and allow the data sets to represent better what those processes look like to see if the language model is capable of learning patterns that can be useful for downstream tasks. Next up, we have this blog post from Paul. And I really like this particular blog post because it is practical and I think it provides very useful insights. As you know, we did a video on structured outputs and the idea of using JSON type as outputs and so on. And so what they're claiming here is that based on their experiments that LLMs are really bad at returning code in JSON. So what they're saying is that not every format or every type of content would be suitable for JSON outputs. And so code is one of those apparently. And and they went into some details on why that is the case after some analysis. LLMs were found to make lots of syntax errors. You can check out the blog post here, but you can see that, yeah, using Markdown is actually better, like reform text. It seems to be better, at least for code. And so that's something that you need to experiment on, right? Like not just use structured outputs just because it's a feature that's available. It might actually hurt your performance and it might actually lead to errors. And in this case, there were like syntax errors and identification errors when they used code with JSON. So just be very extra careful about that. And that's why I wanted to highlight that post. Next up, we have this paper released by Sakana AI and a few other researchers. And I really like this paper. This is one of my favorite papers last week. And I went through this paper, actually read the paper and did a summary of this also in my YouTube channel. I also do these paper explainers and this one really caught my attention. And the reason is because again, they're using these agentic workflows to basically automate the process of scientific discovery. At least that is the goal with the AI scientists that they have announced here. And they're using these frontier LLMs. They're not building LLMs from scratch, but they are figuring out what are the components that they need at least to build this type of agent that can allow for automatic scientific discovery and what they have done here is pretty interesting and remarkable, actually, because they have sort of automated the process of creating and writing up papers, which, as you know, if you're a researcher, you know how tedious and very difficult that process can be and time consuming as well. And they claim that they can do this in less than $15. They can produce full conference level scientific papers at that price. One part that I really liked from this paper was the idea of the automated reviewer to automatically evaluate the generated papers. And they claim to achieve near human performance in evaluating paper scores. They can compare with humans in terms of how they are assessing and evaluating these papers and the criteria and so on. One announcement that went a little bit unnoticed was Agent Q. This one is, again, in the same line as building these agents that can self-improve. And that self-improvement component, similar to what we saw with the Gini, it's really becoming an important part of building these agents, right? The ability to self-improve. But in order to do that, like you actually need to have good data for that. And so what they're doing here is they're proposing this agent that can achieve a variety of tasks and the way they achieve it is through using three components, and you'll see the components here. They're using this Monte Carlo tree search, and this is just to automatically generate data by exploring different actions or web pages. Essentially, they expand the action space using MCTS, using high sample temperatures and diverse properties. So those are little details. You see how this exploration and having more agentic type of data sets that are suitable for this problem. It's a really important component, and we have seen that with or other agents that we covered, uh, they have that particular component. Another component that is emerging as really important is the ability of the AI system to critique itself or judge itself, whatever it's outputting. So like providing some feedback or a feedback loop to refine the agent's decision-making process. 
as we know, in the real world, in order to complete a task, it might actually take a lot of steps and it might actually take long to complete that task. It might actually require like a lot of different tasks to be completed. And so in order to support that, they mentioned here that this step level feedback is crucial for long horizon tasks where sparse signals often lead to learning difficulties. So that's a really critical component for tasks that require a lot of effort and different parts. And this is not surprising, the direct preference optimization to learn effectively from aggregate data sets, including the suboptimal branches explored during search, improving success rates in complex environments. So even those suboptimal branches are considered, and this is important, right? Because what you want is you want to really create a model that can figure out what's the best type of outputs and what is the most preferred type of outputs. And so this process is really important for that. They validated and report some results here on a Lametri model just to show that this actually works. And they went from 18.6 success rate to 81.7. That's a 340% jump after just one day of autonomous data collection and further to 95.4 with online search. So extending it with some access to online search, which I think is incredible. Next up, we have this really interesting paper that I featured a week ago. And this paper basically aims to improve efficiency in rack systems. And I really like the idea proposed in this paper because they are essentially trying to tune models that improves the efficiency of the overall rack system. And with rack systems, we have to do a lot of API calls, and it's usually with these large language models. And how can we minimize and avoid these multiple LLM calls? And so this is the framework that they are proposing to achieve this. And it's a basic idea. Essentially, what they're doing is they're training on autoencoder language model to do labeling and tagging of chunks. So you can see here, they have a question coming in and then there is a retriever and then you have all the little chunks. Basically you classify the chunks as either terminate or continue. If it's continue, then it's fed to this next step, which is a filter model, which is trained to formulate the next hop query based on the original question and previous annotations. And this whole process is done iteratively the goal is to have gathered enough information to answer the initial question. The final generator generates the final answer, and that's how the system is built. So in essence, the two components make up an iterative and efficient system that performs accurate and complex multi-hop question answering using RAD. It's efficient because it avoids multiple LLM calls, as I mentioned before, which is typical for query generation in multi-hop UA RAG. Anyways, do check out the paper. I think it's interesting, all these ideas on how you can improve the efficiency of RAG because everyone wants to use RAG systems, but like the different components that you're using, all the API calls that you're making, all of that will consume a lot of resources and it will probably be very costly. So I think looking into alternative alternatives like this, where you have dedicated components like the filter model and the autoencoder that was used for labeling and tagging chunks. I think all of that stuff is really interesting. We'll see more and more of these ideas proposed to minimize the cost and efficiency of these rack systems. Next up, we have this other paper. It proposed R star which they claim is a self-play mutual reasoning approach that significantly improves reasoning capabilities of small language models without fine-tuning or superior models. So they are eliminating the need for superior models. They are eliminating the need for fine-tuning. They are focusing on small language models to see if they can improve the reasoning capabilities and make them really strong problem solvers. So they use this self play mutual reasoning, which is a generation discrimination process. So the first part here is the target SLM, which is the small language model. So this is the self-generator. And you'll see how they describe it here. A self-generator augments the target SLM to generate candidate reasoning trajectories. And they're using, again, Monte Carlo tree search. We have seen the Monte Carlo tree search for exploring, for searching of these trajectories. We saw that with the agent Q, that was one of the important components. Remember when it was generating synthetic data for the web agent, and it's the same case here. And the discriminator, which is another small language model that's used here, not the same as this one, provides unsupervised feedback on each trajectory based on partial hints. So you can consider that to be another feedback loop, which as we saw with agent Q was another important part. So you're seeing all these components are emerging as super important for these agents. And that's what's really interesting about the current research on agents, right? We see these self-improving components. We see the MCTS for balancing exploration and exploitation. And finally, what they do here is they use the target SLM. So based on those feedbacks that were generated by this LM2, the target SLM decides a final reasoning trajectory as a solution. So this is a 
very simple framework, but I believe that it, there's a lot of opportunity here to expand it and to keep improving it. And the use of small language models is quite intriguing to me because small language models, as we know, they are not as capable as the bigger ones, but because we have methods for good distillation of these models or pruning these models into smaller versions that are still as capable as the big ones, I think there's a lot of potential for these type of methods. And it's obviously very aligned with where the field is going. And on that note, my, my final announcement that I want to feature here is around that same idea of pruning and distilling larger models into very capable, smaller versions of it. And what NVIDIA has done here is distill a LAMA 3.18 billion. So this 8 billion is a very capable model as we have covered in the past to an NVIDIA LAMA 3.1 Minitron 4 billion model that is just as capable as the big one. I think this was an interesting development given, again, the importance of these smaller language models in the field of research. So I won't go through all the details here. I'm going to jump straight into the results. Why I like this blog post is that it actually focuses on explaining what pruning is and what distillation. This is a bit auto scope for the video, but if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments and I could probably do a more detailed video on what this idea of pruning and distillation means. I think it's going to become a more and more important approach as we continue to develop these very large language models and we want to leverage their capabilities, but we want to do it in a more efficient way, meaning that we probably want to distill to smaller models with the same capabilities as the bigger models, because not every use case, we are going to need that big model, right? That general purpose, large system. They show results here and you can see that this is the original LAMA 3.18 billion model. And these are the ones that they are proposing. So this is depth prune and this is width prune. So like maybe reducing the size of the hidden layer. This one is more about reducing the layers. So you see there's results here on how they compare. They're actually pretty close to the original 8B model. And this can only improve, right? So there's a lot of ways in how this can potentially be improved through extended experiments. But it's actually very promising to see that the gap in results is reducing. This means that Potentially something like this can be applied to even bigger models. So you can imagine this being applied to like the 70B or even the 405 billion LAMA model. So these are preliminary results on the smaller models just because of how much resources it takes. But actually with pruning and distilling, that's the thing, right? It's going to cost you less compared to you training an entire language model from scratch or even fine tuning a language model on a large data set. So I really like this idea of pruning and distilling. I think it's going to become more prominent as we move forward. And these are just comparisons with other models like Gemma 2 and Pi 2, which are comparable models because of the size. But again, very impressive results that they're getting here. They show also some performance benchmarks on different precisions like FP8 and FP16. There's a lot of conversation about that. What is the precision that's going to give you the best? outcomes and so that's was tested as well in general i would say the minitron 4b models regardless if they're using depth or width pruning performs relatively well compared to just a standard llama 3.18 billion model and that will be it for this episode of llm news hopefully there was something useful and interesting for you let me know in the comments if you found anything interesting or you have any questions so thank you for listening Please consider leaving a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And I will see you all on the next one.